Let us turn together in God's Word to Galatians 5. Galatians 5, we'll be looking at verses 16 through 26 uh, this evening. Galatians 5, 16 to 26. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, And things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So far, the reading from God's Word this evening. May He add its blessing to our hearts. I want to begin by asking a question, maybe several questions. Is it possible to be a worldly Christian? Is it possible that Jesus would be your Savior and at the same time not your Lord? Well, the very thought of these questions would be altogether denied by the passage that we have just read together. Paul here, after spending chapters on dealing with what it means to be justified by faith alone, now sets before us the idea that those who would be in Christ, those who would be called by the name Christian, are not altogether free from the obligations of God's law. That's because to live by the Spirit is, in fact, to live under the law. Not under the law as a condemning agent. Not under the law as, as one which would accuse us of our guilt before God, because our guilt has been satisfied. Our guilt has been paid for. But that we would live under the law as a guiding principle, something that shows us what it means to love God, something that shows us what it means to express our thanksgiving to God for the fact that He has paid for the guilt of our sin. And Paul, uh, to teach us this in the end of chapter 5 here, sets before us Two ways. And he does that first in in verses 16 through 18. Then he manifests each of the two ways that he's going to to set before us in more detail. So, he sets before us the way of the flesh from verses 19 through 21. And he sets before us the way of the spirit from verses 22 to 26. So, uh, what we're seeking to, uh, uh, to learn from our passage tonight, the one thing that I want us to walk away from in terms of an understanding of this passage... It is this, to live by the Spirit is to live under the law not as a condemning agent, but as the guiding principle to walk in the ways of our Heavenly Father. Paul's going to show us two ways in verses 16 through 18. He's going to show us the way of the flesh in verses 19 through 21. And then he's going to show us the way of the Spirit in verses 22 through 26. So let's begin by considering the two ways that Paul would have us see Paul has spent the bulk of this letter talking about justification by faith alone. He is urging the Galatians to hold fast to this doctrine as a central doctrine, a doctrine that throughout the age of the church has been recognized as the bedrock of the church. And he sets before them the freedom that they have as those who have been exonerated, those who have been forgiven in Christ Jesus. He began that in Chapter 5, verse 1, for freedom Christ has set you free. This freedom from the dominion, no, from the guilt of sin. This freedom that we 
have from the burden uh, that sin is on us as we're living under the law as a covenant of works, perhaps. But then he also says in verse 13 that we were called to freedom, but that we are not to use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. That we're not to use the freedom that we have in Christ in order to indulge our sinful nature. That we're not to live as if we were still enslaved in Egypt. And so here in our passage, as we begin uh, to look at verse 16, where Paul speaks of walking by the Spirit and not gratifying the desires of the flesh, uh, Paul sets before us two competing spiritual forces. Now, I don't want you to get me wrong. This is not yin and yang. This is not two equal powers and we have to try to have a struggle to overcome and, and end up on the good side of things. Uh, this is uh, Paul speaking of two competing spiritual forces. These forces are not equal, but they are in opposition one to another. They are at enmity one with another. The flesh wars against the spirit, and the spirit wars against the flesh. He is speaking of these two opposite forces, flesh and spirit, or, or life in the natural state, life apart from Christ, and life after uh, regeneration. He's speaking of, of these two opposite, opposite forces. And so in light of the freedom discussion, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that to live by the Spirit excludes life according to the flesh. And you see that in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I want to focus in on that word gratify there in verse 16 for a brief moment because sometimes when you're moving from Greek to English, you lose something in the translation. And the word that's translated gratify here by the ESV uh, translators, uh, it, literally in the, in the Greek language, is fulfill. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And it's very important that we recognize the difference between the words uh, fulfilling or the, the, the implications of that word fulfilling there in the passage. Because while sin remains in this world, we as God's people will sin. While sin remains in the world, we will be tempted and we will fall. However, as those who walk by the Spirit, sin is not fulfilled in us. Sin does not meet its final maturity in us. The Christian, in other words, is not given over to sin. When we sin, it causes grief in our heart. There is a struggle against our sin, and it's ongoing. It's inevitable in the life of the Christian. For the life of the Christian, we're always fighting flesh and spirit, spirit and flesh. And this is the agony of our hearts. By the Spirit or by the flesh? How are we going to live? The Spirit will lead to life and the flesh will lead to death. We see this all throughout the Scriptures. And I, I don't think there is a better place to turn to understand the, the, the dichotomy between flesh and spirit than the, epistle, the, the gospel of of the Apostle John. There John is often drawing the distinction between flesh and spirit. Uh, for example, John chapter 6 and verse 63. There uh, the Apostle John records Jesus' words and, he, and Jesus says there, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The two opposites. We looked at opposites in the proverb this morning. Well, there's opposites here in this passage as well. Spirit and flesh. Those are opposites. The spirit will give life to you. The flesh is of no help to you at all. In addition, we learn from John's gospel that our lives are, are properly oriented through our dwelling in the spirit. You see that several chapters later in, in John 14 and, and verse 15 through 17. There Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, 
because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. You see there the spirit and the flesh. When you are apart from Christ, you will not live according to the spirit. It will be impossible for you. You cannot receive him because he is given uh, by faith. And what does he help those whom he indwells? What does he help them with? He helps them with faithfulness to the commandments of God. Love expressed through keeping the commandments. This is the difference between the spirit and the flesh. The spirit helps you in that realm. The flesh gives you nothing. The, the, the difference, the opposite between these two, uh, these two ways of life. Now, when the Bible is speaking about walking and living by the Spirit, it is speaking to the regenerate. In the Bible, there are, again, two kinds of people. In John 3, verse 5 and 6, Jesus, talking to Nicodemus, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is is spirit. You're either born by the spirit or you are born by the flesh. And that's what Paul is, is setting before us. He's setting before us the spirit and the flesh. And more than that, he's saying in verse 17 that these two things are opposed one to another. That means that if you have the one, you cannot have the other. If you have the other, you cannot have uh, the one. This is what Paul says to us. You cannot live by the flesh if you have the Spirit and, and vice versa. He also says that this contrast is given to us for our own protection. In verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, uh, sorry, in verse 17, these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. There is, ever since Genesis 3.15, an enmity between the flesh and and the Spirit, between the people of God and the enemies of God, between the Holy Spirit and the flesh. And, and here he is saying that that contrast is made so that we would not do the things we want to do. Can you imagine if the flesh and the Spirit were indistinguishable, one from another? How could we examine ourselves to see sin at work in us? But what God does in His great mercy, He, he makes sin apparent. He makes the spirit, the, the walking in the Spirit apparent that we would know, that we would be kept from doing the things that we would want to do. Now, uh, as he sets these two ways before us, he, he does so with a very clear understanding that one is acceptable to the Christian and the other is not. Uh, the Spirit is what is to be, so life in the Spirit is what is to be sought and not life into the flesh. We, uh, in the flesh. We already saw that in verse 13. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. We're not to give opportunity for the flesh. But if we live by the Spirit, it says here in our passage, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So Paul here is, is condemning the view. Condemning the view of the whole idea of a worldly Christian. Condemning the view uh, that Jesus can be your Savior and not your Lord. He is making the same argument that he has made previously or that he would chronologically make later in Romans chapter 6. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul's resounding answer is, by no means. By no means. So then to protect us from following the flesh, Paul takes some time to define the way of the flesh force. And he does that beginning in verse 19. Paul there makes the evidences of life in the flesh very clear. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not do these things. And Paul gives a long catalog of, of, man, of behaviors that those who live by the Spirit, they will not walk in them. Immorality, false worship, seeking to divide, drunkenness, etc., to, to engage in these things is, is to live according to the flesh. Now, what is important to see here is that this is not a random list of behaviors that Paul simply pulls from the sky. It's very important that we recognize the source of what Paul is describing. Now, he has just said in verse 18 
If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. But that doesn't mean that the law is insignificant in the life of those who walk by the Spirit. Think about the descriptions that Paul gives here in this catalog. They're all violations of the moral law. They're all violations of the Ten Commandments. He's, he talks in this list of sexual immorality and impurity and, in, and sensuality and orgies. These are all violations of the Seventh Commandment. He speaks of idolatry and, and sorcery, and, and those are violations of the First and, and Second Commandment. He speaks of enmity and strife and anger and, and drunkenness. These are all uh, in seed form, perhaps, but all violations of the Sixth Commandment. He speaks of jealousy and rivalries and envy. And then we remember that in his law, he says, you shall not covet. A violation of the Tenth Commandment. So you see when he says in verse 18, you are not under the law, that doesn't mean that you are free from the law's presence in your life. In verses 19 through 21, he describes that life according to the flesh is violating the law of God. So the law itself is not the problem, but it is the position that the law takes in your life. The freedom that Paul is setting before us when it comes to the law again only deals with man's attempts to justify himself by law-keeping. Obeying the law in order to make God your debtor. This is the very thing that Paul is attacking. He, he, he's not speaking of removing the obligation of the law insofar as it is applied to one born of the Spirit because the law reflects the Spirit. The Spirit and the law are in agreement because the law reflects the character of God. And so Paul, he's very stern in his warning, isn't he? In, in verse 21, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's a, a strong warning. And it should make all of us stop and pause. All of us should stop and, and pause and reflect on our lives because we all live in a way that reflects the flesh sometimes. We break the commandments, we sin, and we will continue to do so until we are glorified. So what's Paul saying? That those who stumble and fall, that they will be outside the kingdom of God? Well, wouldn't that be a return to legalism, the very thing that he's been fighting against all along? Wouldn't it be wrong to say that uh, we have to reach a certain level of perfection in order to enter into the kingdom of God? No, Paul's not saying that. Paul's warning is, is along the lines of saying that one indwelt by the Spirit cannot continue to live under the rule of his flesh. You cannot continue to live in your sin. The believer can't simply point to his redemption and say, now what I do makes no difference at all. He can't simply appeal to his nature and say, now it doesn't matter anymore. He's been given a new nature, a new heart, and Paul is saying, if you have been given this new nature, if you have been given this new heart, now sin will not rule over you anymore. Now sin will not be your master anymore. In fact, sin in time will become odious to you, just as it is odious to your Savior. So then to contrast the way of the flesh, he also speaks to us about the way of the Spirit. And he does that because if we will no longer be comfortable with sin and the flesh, something has to take its place. It has to be changed in some way. So for the regenerate turning his back on on sin, that's an, an essential part of his repentance when, when he is converted. When we sin and we stumble and we fall and God, uh, he picks us up again, we will repent. 
we will turn from our sin. We will not remain comfortable in it. Hating sin is part of the change of your nature because He has given you a new heart. Right now, at this moment, it has nothing to do with your feelings. It's an objective truth for the regenerate. Right now, if you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is indwelling you. He is indwelling you. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. He is indwelling you, and there's nothing you can do to get rid of Him. He is living in you, and He will always be there. Now, from Ephesians 4, we know that we can grieve the Spirit. From 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19, we know that we can quench the Spirit. But if Christ has bought you with His blood, you cannot drive Him out. If Christ has made you His own, He will be seen in you. His fruit will be evidenced. Now, I don't know if you are like me, but I am, I don't even know what the proper word is for this discipline, but when it comes to the study of trees and recognizing them, what is that, arborology or something like that, I am challenged. I, I don't even know what the word is, right? But I do know something. I know that if I see an apple on a tree, that is an apple tree. I know that if I see a peach on a tree, that is a peach tree. If I see a pear on a tree, I know it's a pear tree. The fruit of the tree helps me to recognize its nature. And so it is with the believer. The fruit in his life will show who he is, whose he is, or she is. The fruit is an evidence to the kind of person that you are. And so the same is true for those born of the Spirit. If you have been born by the Spirit, you are Spirit. That's what it says in John 3. And if you are Spirit, you will manifest your new nature by revealing His presence in you. And it may be slow, and you may not feel like that's what's happening in your life, but that is what will most certainly happen in your life if Christ's blood has purchased you. You will have love in your life. You will see joy. You will grow in peace and in patience and in kindness. Goodness will be demonstrated in your actions. Faithfulness in your relationships to God and man. Gentleness towards your fellow man. And when it comes to your sins that you wallowed in before, now you will exercise self-control. And when these well up in from, from your heart by the Spirit's presence, you will never be convicted as a lawbreaker. That's what it says at the end of verse 23. Against such things there is no law. There is no law in all of Scripture that says you shall not love. Why do you think that is? Well, it's because love is a reflection of God's nature. The Spirit is love. You remember John 3.16, For God so loved the world. Love is manifest in God Himself. And so there will never be a law that says you shall not love. In fact, when you love as a Christian, you are demonstrating a manifestation of God's love for you to others. This is His work in you. His presence is being seen and shown in you. And this same test can be levied against any and all of the other fruits that, that Paul gives in, in this passage. God will never forbid His people from looking like Him. He never will forbid His people from looking like Him. Never mind that this fruit is only possible because of His presence in you. To condemn the evidences of this fruit in your life would be to condemn God Himself, and that can never be. So the way of the flesh is, is cast aside for the one indwelt by the Spirit. The way of the flesh is, is taken off, and it's nailed to the cross of Christ, never to be ruling over you again. The guilt of these actions of the flesh are crucified with Christ. You remember a few chapters earlier, and as the children are memorizing this in the, in the children's Sunday school class, I have been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the life of the regenerate. Life in Christ. Life by the Spirit. Not living yourself anymore. Now you're living by faith. So when we do the things of the flesh as believers, when we sin as believers, we're acting contrary to our nature. We're acting contrary to the presence of the Spirit in us. And that is why, dearly beloved, as Christians, we can never be content with our sin. That is why, as believers, when we sin against God, it breaks our heart. We crawl to Him and we beg for His forgiveness. Maybe not right away. Maybe there are seasons in our lives where, where we think we're blessing ourselves by indulging in great sin. But it always brings us low. It always brings us to ruin when we are in Christ. And the source of our life is, is found in our union with Christ who has sent the Spirit to indwell us. And when we are so indwelt, we will also walk in the ways of the Spirit. This conformity to Christ and, and His law that is ours is always a response to our regeneration. It's a necessary response to our regeneration. The God who regenerates you also justifies you. The God who justifies you also adopts you. The God who adopts you also sanctifies you. He will not leave you uh, in your sin. So there should be a simple recognition when we see fruit in our lives. And it's not boasting. It's not pride. It's not patting ourselves on the, on the back and, and, and thinking about how much better we are now. But there should simply be a, a recognition. This is Christ in me. This is Christ in me. This is the hope of my glory. It's His work and not my work. So there's several things that we uh, learn as we consider the way of the flesh as it's opposed to the way of the Spirit. First thing we learn is that it matters how you live. I want us to forget the notion that because you are forgiven in Christ, you can indulge yourself. The Bible is ethical because God is ethical. He calls you to be holy as He is holy. That's God's standard for us in, in His Word. God gives you grace from the guilt of your sin, but also He gives you grace from the dominion of sin. No longer does sin rule over you. And so you cannot ignore Scripture and choose either only freedom from guilt or freedom from dominion. You have both when you are in Christ. The second thing that we are called to in this passage is to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Now it's easy, I think in our prayer time even, we see how easy it is to become discouraged when we compare ourselves to the righteous standard of God. We compare ourselves to all His purity and all His holiness, and when we sin, we're brought so low. And that is a good thing, because when we sin, it matters. But God is a patient God. God is a God who removes your transgressions as far as east is from west. God is a God who is patient and who gives time and who sanctifies you. He begins a work in you and He will carry it to completion. He is grieved by your sin. It's true. But your sin is also forgiven in Christ. He does not look upon it anymore. In fact, you are rescued from your sin and you're not to remain in your sin so because of god's patience in light of god's patience we are to not be content with our sin but that but we're to be busy killing our sin that's the doctrine of mortification now john owen he has this quote many people have heard of it it's dealing with how we respond to the sin that's found in our lives and John Owen asked this question, Do you mortify? Do you put your sin to death? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it whilst you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. This is the life 
of the Christian to live each day afresh, to learn to kill the sin manifest in you. And then finally, we learn that we're to live in the power of the Spirit. Now, I'm not talking about some mystical, out-of-body experience. Life in the Spirit is, is not that complicated. To live by the Spirit is simply to recognize that sin is mortified in us. And it's hard to describe that part to other people, how God puts sin to death in our des desires, how He does that work. But its fruit is not hard to describe. It's not hard to see the change that God works in our lives. As a Christian, you can easily see if what you are doing is of the Spirit or of the flesh. Now, it does require self-examination on our part to stop and to look at the things that we've said and done and thought, even examining our motives in certain things that we have said and done and thought. But we should care whether or not we are living by the Spirit. And you can do this. If you have children at home, it's a painful exercise. Or if you have a, uh, a spouse, maybe you need to find a close friend who knows you well and ask him, do you think I'm an impatient person? Do I live at peace with other people? Do I have a peaceful outlook on life? These would be evidences of the Spirit's fruit, and we should crave these evidences all the more. If somebody comes to you and says, you're not a patient person, that would be an evidence of the presence of the flesh in your life. Now, that doesn't mean that things are hopeless for you. It doesn't mean that you're not a believer. The fact that you would be grieved over the absence of patience in your life shows the working of the Spirit in your life. And so you turn to Him, and you pray that these fruits would be manifested in you more and more, that He would grant you in greater abundance and with greater consistency the fruits that are described here in Galatians chapter 5. So Paul puts to rest the idea that we can live in such a way as to justify ourselves, but he also negates the idea that it doesn't matter how we live. We are called to live by the Spirit under the law, not as a condemning agent, but as the guiding principle to walk in the ways of our Heavenly Father. It is His fruit manifest in us, and in this fruit we see evidence of the outworking of the gospel in our lives. Let's pray together.